Christ. Please welcome Vera Marie Calandra to Champion Shrine America's Marian Apparition Site. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very novice at this, um, but I thank very, uh, Corey very much and the Shrine for having the center out with you for your novena. The Padre Pio came into our life back in 1965 or 67 uh, before I was born. I just did that wrong. And how can I say, the family was in need at that time. And in Thanksgiving, in Thanksgiving, the center came about. I am the fifth of six children of Harry and Vera Calandra. And at the time, Padre Pio, my mom was given a book on Padre Pio, and at that time, she did not need Padre Pio. Padre Pio was the friar on the mountain, as you can say, in San Giovanni Rotondo. So she put that book on the shelf until myself came along, the fifth of the six children. And at that time when I was born, it was born with massive urinary defects of the bladder and everything urological. I was taken from, children, from the hospital where I was born and brought right down to Children's Hospital. And at that time, the doctor was Dr. C. Everett Koop. And he was just beside himself with the condition I was in. And back in 1966, medicine is not what it is today. So unfortunately, the doctors just simply gave up hope. And they said, just go home. Like, call the undertaker. There's nothing more we can do. At that time, mom did not accept that as an answer. She wanted to know that there's got to be more. We're originally from the Philadelphia area of Norristown. So they did all of the local shrines in the Philadelphia area of St. Jude Shrine, uh, Blessed John Newman. And it just, it wasn't enough. The doctors still were just, there's, there's truly nothing more we can do. At this point, we think we're just going to have to remove her bladder and make her the most comfortable because she can be and then you can take her home to die. So of course, parents not giving up. Mom went back to that book that she just needed to put on a shelf because Padre Pio and that was not needed. And she, and she did, and she just sat there and she just started praying with all of her heart to give me an answer. Someone, don't let my daughter die. And at that time, I was two and a half years old. And upon remembering the book that was given to her a few years prior, she took it off the shelf and she started reading it. And that is when Padre Pio came to her and he simply said to her, in what we consider to be a locution, bring your, your little girl to me and do not delay. And that was the summer of 1968. So my father owned an Italian delicatessen, and she went to him and she said, Harry, you're not gonna believe what happened, but this is what's happened, and this is our only hope. We have to get Vera over to Italy. All the, the, the people in the Norristown area, because we were a very well-known family because of our delicatessen, they really, they, they took mom apart. They made fun of her, the crazy lady, you're gonna bring your dying baby over to Italy. Plus you just have a newborn that was born a few weeks beforehand. And she said, yes, I am, because there is something was pulling her over to Padre Pio. And she had never been out of Norristown basically ever. So she needed to get passports and passports for the infant. And back then it was a family passport. So we were all on one. And it wasn't you know, the kind of going through TSA like we, we do nowadays. But it was traveling with a newborn, a sick baby, herself, my brother, and 10 suitcases loaded with cloth diapers because 
they also did not have what we have today, disposables. So upon all that, she borrowed the money from her brother and she bought her airline tickets, of course, with dad's blessing, who took care of the other children that remained at home. And she made her way over, not knowing really where to go, of course not how to speak the language, and in the dead of the heat, when the heat over there is sweltering, and some of you I've, I've learned have been over to Italy, and you know that when it's hot, there's rarely any air conditioning, and forget ice, that doesn't happen. So she, she got her plane tickets, she arrived with her luggage and her children in Rome, and she took the train from Rome to Foggia. Now, that train ride that should have been about five hours was over seven, because the trains back then started breaking down. And she was fighting with Pudge. She says, who are you? Why did you bring me here? What do you want? I'm sick. My infant is sick. And the sick one that's sick that's coming over to see you is still dying. And she, she shared that she just remembered sitting on the train with the window cracked just a little and sweating profusely because there were so many on the train. And she just said, if you really want me to come here, do something, let me know. What do you want from me? We need help. And out of the clear blue, as cold as water can be, a man put a bottle of water through a window while the train was stopped. And she knew that was Padre Pio because he was gone. She couldn't even turn her head to say thank you in a language she couldn't speak anyway. And he, he just totally disappeared. And she nursed that bottle of water with all of us, you know, sipping it all the way there. So she got herself to San Giovanni. And upon getting there, made her way up to the, the monastery. And again, she didn't like, my mother's a very strong Italian, Italian-minded woman. <laughs> as we all are, huh, Nick? <laughs> and she didn't like the answer she heard from the monastery either. You know, you need to come back. Padre Pio is sick. You can't come today. So she was obedient. She didn't know what to do. She went back to the hotel. And mind you, she walked from the, the hotel she was at, which was basically what we consider now to be like a bed and breakfast, just someone's house, basically. So she went the next day, and she saw Padre Pio. She was there at 4 o'clock in the morning for his 5 o'clock mass, as she was told to do. And she waited in a corridor, because at that time, it was only maybe four or five months that people, women, were permitted to see Padre Pio because women were pulling at him constantly, at his habit, at his beard, at his cord, and his rosaries. So they, per, they took women away from seeing Padre Pio. It was only men. So it was, again, another grace that here's a woman with her children coming over to see him, and now she was able to see him. Women were permitted. And she knelt down in front of him, as she was instructed to do, with Christina in her arms, myself standing, and my brother. And he looked at her being wheeled through, past. And he looked at her, and he just looked at her. And he kept going. Well, that totally infuriated her. <laughs> you brought me here, and this is all you did? Really? Who are you? She sent my brother with two men from Australia the next morning to go get her a private appointment with Padre Pio which of course, Americans, that's what you do. You're, you're demanding. That didn't work. The, they actually saw a priest named Father Pio Maria Giordano, who we actually met in 2009. And he said, you tell your mother to come back tomorrow morning. Again, at the four, be here four o'clock for the five o'clock mass. And she was ready to just unload on him. She was where she needed to be. She was exactly at the time and everything. And this time, 
as he was being wheeled through the corridor, she was ready to go at him. And they looked at each other and their eyes just totally locked. And they spoke to each other through their hearts. And she said, make a promise. Her promise was, make a miracle so the world will believe. And that was her Thanksgiving. That was September 1st, 1968. And the center is here because of her promise. And we're doing as much as we can still to make Padre Pio known. Upon the return of the family go coming back to a Philadelphia area, the doctors told her simply that if she's still alive, bring her back. And they did. We went back and we had x-rays. And the doctor says, so what did you do? Where did you take her? And my parents are like, well, what are you talking about? You forbid us to go. We said, we're doing what we want. And he said, the bladder that I removed is there. He said, so I don't know what you did, but keep doing it because we could not have done this. And that is the grace that we received. And in 19, the summer of 1969, she went back over to Italy to thank Padre Pio. Let me go back. A few weeks after we came home, she heard on the news that Padre Pio had died. And then everything came together. She understood, come quickly and do not delay, as he knew he was going to die. But of course, she did not. But it all worked. It all came together. The following year, 1969, she went over to say thank you. And she told the priests, I made a promise. What can I do to spread Padre Pio? And she started with just some leaflets. And they said, you know, people make promises. Doesn't mean they're going to keep them. So they kind of, you know, just half-heartedly gave her some leaflets. And, and but she came back every year after that. And that ended up being our summers, staying there for three months during the summer and working with the friars as young children. So we basically grew up with Padre Pio. So, and again, we just continue the best way we know how. So I thank you, and maybe one day you'll come out to Pennsylvania. <laughs> Do you want this? Yeah, don't go anywhere, don't go anywhere. Any um, questions? Oh, yeah. Anybody have any questions about Vera or anything, experiences, cool. family, anything like that? <coughs> Can I ask what is the, the word that you use that your mother Locution. Locution is like an inner, an inner voice in your mind because she was praying and talking and then that's when she heard very clearly in her mind, come quickly and do not delay. No, it was not. That's a really good question because it was prior to Padre Pio's death. It has to be after Padre Pio's death is where they could be attributed to him. Yeah, it's interesting. It's part of the, it's part of the proof that that person is in heaven interceding with God. Because he had certain of the miracles while he was on earth, and that's what they look at as evidence that that person is in God, you know, is with, is with God asking for intercession. So it always, those miracles to be uh, as part of the canonization process have to be after the person has died. So that, that, that question was, was the miracle that Vera experienced one that was used as part of the canonization process for Padre Pio? Oh. Okay. And the first one was, what, what is it called that her mom experienced with Padre Pio talking? We call it an interlocution. Yes. Anybody else? All right, so. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, the question I didn't plant her. <laughs> <laughs> so
So my name is Nick Jaboni. I'm the director of the center, and I'm not a relative. Almost everyone that works there is related and has worked there for decades and decades. Um, so th that's great. I, I can answer that question. Um, come to the center. So the center started the organization in 1969, after Vera's mom, Vera, made that promise to come back, spread devotion. And so the center has kind of gone through a few iterations, if you will. First was like an, an information, and it started at their kitchen table in the little town of Norristown outside of Philadelphia. And eventually it grew more and more. And it's very interesting that her mother never asked for money. And the, the Franciscan idiom, what did the friars tell her about don't ask for No, don't ever ask for money. It will come. Yeah. It will come. And that is how everything was built, was just spreading information on Padre Pio. And people started with a trust and a love and a devotion, actually, to my mom. Because when they gave a donation, they knew it was being used because there was always something coming back that she had done in Italy. Yeah, so so much, so much was donated. People, I guess as Vera went around and they heard more and more about Padre Pio, they fell in love with Padre Pio. They really wanted to contribute in some way. Uh, and so donations were given. They were able to gradually build the center. In 1971, the center took on the title, The Cause for Padre Pio. And so they really took on in the United States um, the, there's so much money that's actually involved in a cause for a saint. If you think about it, they have to investigate. They have to look at everything that saint ever wrote to see is there any heresy in there, to investigate a life of holiness. And Padre Pio had so many miracles and so many people that knew him, so many letters to spiritual children, so many letters to spiritual directors, all this correspondence. So it cost a lot of money to fly people around to do these investigations. So it's National Center for Padre Pio became the cause for Padre Pio. And her mother was so involved with that cause and so respected by the Capuchins, by the folks at the Vatican uh, who you know, oversee the investigation, that she was asked in 1999, she did the first reading at the Beatification Mass uh, for Padre Pio. So we have some pictures at the center of her uh, doing that first reading with Pope John Paul II, who she came to know, um, you know, kind of behind her in the background. And then the canonization, of course, in, uh, in 2002. Unfortunately, she was too ill to, uh, to attend. She died of cancer in 2003. But the center in 1999, it's an amazing story, the same morning of the beatification, there were about 22,000 people that came to the came to Bartow, Pennsylvania, and there was the building that was built there. We had been in a 16-acre uh, a 16 acre little farm met with a, a bank barn and that, that served as a center for a while. And then when the funds were raised, Vera had the vision that she wanted to make a place where people could come who would not be able to go to San Giovanni Rotundo. So on its, a nice 106 acre property and when you go, it, it, was, it was graded and there's rolling hills and just like you're going up the mountain to San Giovanni to see Padre Pio, to see the friary, same type of effect when you come to see us. And then there's a building that is called our Spirituality Center building. And in there, kind of like a large multi-purpose room, kind of like this one here where there can be for masses and talks. But then there's a smaller, it's, a, it's an exact reproduction of Padre Pio's, uh, the Our Lady of Grace Chapel that is in San Giovanni Rotundo. So we have the same kind of setup so, so people can see that. So that was the first building in 99. It was open that morning as the buses were coming in, they were getting the approvals, the occupancy permits. And so the same day it opened up. So that was pretty incredible. Uh, there were artists from Portugal that came over to help to do the handmade reproductions of the pews and everything and the, and the paintings. And they're working with the American contractors at the same time and they're teaching them and they're working around the clock for the last three weeks to get it done. It was, it's an incredible story. But anyway, so, so that opened up in 99. And then in 2004, right, uh, the second building opened up, which serves as our, we have a museum, which we, they, I read before I came to work at the center, which is a world-class museum. Oh, okay, I got there. I was like, oh my gosh, this is a world-class museum. There, there's, there, there's reproductions of uh, Padre Pio's, um, the farmhouse that he grew up in, some of those rooms, and then the little farmhouse that was in the, it was a couple miles away where they would go in the summer because that's where the family that owns some land for farming, where they would go during the summer harvest months. Then we have a reproduction of Padre Pio's cell, uh, his friary cell. Uh, we have a number of relics of, uh, I guess they would be, I guess now they are second class relics from uh, the beatification mass from Pope John Paul II. For Vera, her mom, for the work that she did, 
on the cause, she was given the highest level of papal honors. What's that called? Pro Ecclesiae Pontifici. Okay, so we got so we have some great things from Pope John Paul II, um, and then um, we have a reproduction of the the car, the same car that used to drive him around him in, in San Giovanni. It's really it's really phenomenal, and some great other. Uh, relics there as well. And then, of course, everybody always wants to go to the gift shop, so we have a nice <laughs> gift shop in there as well. So it's really funny. Like some people, it's like, I have to go to the gift shop. Well, we have this great chapel too, if you want to see it. But, um, yeah. <laughs> so that's what you would see. That's the long, that's the long answer. Yeah. Great question. Yes. So we have a four volume, three or four? Three volume. Three volume. It hasn't, there are four books of letters in, uh, in Italian. So far, they've only translated the first three, but it's just called letters. And yes, that's, I think it's a copy of every letter that they have that he's, that, that he's written. Yes. Yeah. Can I get that online? Yes, you can get it online at our website in our gift shop. What's yeah. What's the website? Oh, yes, the website is just padrepio.org.org. And we do have brochures at our table, which is in, in their gift shop, with that information as well. We have my, my cards are over there, too, so if you forget, it's got the website on the back and our, and our Facebook page, too. Yeah. And you mentioned that um, for many summers, your family would go mm -hmm. No, it's not as necessary as much because San Giovanni is so established. Padre Pio is a saint. And it just seems that here, Padre Pio is needed more in the U.S. So we have, Mom did log in many, many years of traveling throughout the U.S. with Father Alessio. And they set up many, many prayer groups all over the U.S. So her work really, when we started expanding, needed to be focused on more where we were, where we are now. Yeah, so they set up, her, her mom went over and set up for the friars in Italy, the English communications office, because they, they didn't have one. Um, it's still there. And actually, was it just, was it Maria that worked in the English office? Mm -hmm. Or her sister Maria, who's our general manager still now in, in the US, uh, worked there for a summer and they helped to get up the English communications office set up and that's still there. Um, but we actually handle a lot of, I remember when I started, I said, well, why are people calling us from all over the world? Why aren't they calling San Giovanni? I said, well, they're not really equipped to handle all that. So we're kind of like the information center for much of the in English speaking world. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so the question is, is the center still in Norristown? No, it's located about, was it like 45 minutes mm -hmm. uh, northwest in a little town called Bartow, which is the the biggest city near us, which isn't really big, is called Pottstown, Pennsylvania, but we're about an hour northwest of uh, the city of Philadelphia. They outgrew Norristown. They didn't have 106 acres available there. <laughs> we relocated in 1990 to Bartow from Norristown. Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm just curious, you said um, when your mom decided to go over the first time, mm -hmm. Uh, the question was, so when they decided to, when her mom decided to go over the first time and the relatives and friends and neighbors said that she was crazy, was there any animosity or did that clear up quickly? It did not actually clear up quickly within the family. Um, within the neighborhood, yes, because my father was the most local Italian delicatessen right across from our parish, which is Italian. So again, dad kept everyone like from the parish very up to date because they would come from church and go right over to a store. As for the family, believe it or not, even hardships between my, my mom and her one brother in particular, until a few weeks before he died, he came and he apologized to her. And he said, Vera, like you were right all along, I am sorry what, what you have done in the US with and for Padre Pio. So yeah, even within her own family, she was one of 13. They did hold grudges that, why are you going across the ocean when you have sick you know, kids at home? It's like, well, Harry was there. 
you know, it's just, yeah. People did have, say what they wanted to say to her. And I think Padre Pio even guided her responses to her own family members. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. The question was, how has Vera's health been since then uh, with her general health and her bladder? It's been very good, thank you. Um, along with everything that I mentioned that I had wrong, it was also a kidneys were involved. So actually in 1985, I had a kidney transplant. And the doctors were shocked because they're, I was just turning 18. Actually, two days before my 18th birthday, I got the news that I was dying of kidney failure. And I, I, I didn't feel sick. I had lost a whole bunch of weight, and I just thought it was you know, just working, just being busy. And the doctor basically said, sent me for one test and then another test to confirm it. And he brought me into the room, and both of my parents happened to be there, and they're like, you need a kidney transplant. I don't even know how you're walking. You have no kidney function for the last so many years. And it's like, but I feel fine. And they're like, no, you need a transplant or you're not going to make it a whole you know, few months. So everything that's involved with a transplant, I had to go through you know, the dialysis, the diet, all that kind of stuff. And like I said, I'm, I'm one of eight, six children, and three actually were matches. Because even my baby sister, who was not old enough at that time to be tested, she had to get permission and waivers from a courthouse and whatnot to be, to be tested. And the one who was a match was actually two months, October, two months prior to that got married. So she had to put kids off for two years. If not, if she would have gotten pregnant on her honeymoon, it would have never happened with the transplant. So again, she didn't. and. It all worked out, and December the 10th, Our Lady of Loretto was the transplant, and we were fine, and her oldest son is what, Nick? <laughs> 30. He works at the center, Nicholas. So it's very, very healthy. Thank you. Aren't you the longest surviving kidney transplant patient from University of Pennsylvania Hospital? If I make it to 40 years, yes, I will be. How many years are you? 32. Nicholas wow. is eight. Easy, uh, easy. 34, 35, yeah. And he's a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Vera, how do you celebrate the feast of Padre Pio? Question is, how does Vera celebrate the feast of Padre Pio? <laughs> we work. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Um, Nick got permission for, for us from our local bishop, Schlert, uh, Alfred Schlert, to have a novena leading up to his feast day. So it was from September 15 to September 23. And we had mass every day. And believe it or not, we were shocked, right, Nick, at the good turnout even during the week um, for mass. So that is actually how we celebrated. We worked and we had an even bigger feast day weekend, September 21 and 22, um, where we had, we hosted a few thousand people over that weekend. I think, yeah. So we worked up until then, and then we worked that weekend. So we do. That's, that is what the Calandras were, were on hands, people. Sure. Yeah. Question is, how many people go through our center every year? That is a great question. And when I started there 19 months ago, I said, what do you mean you don't keep track of how many people go through the center? <laughs> This is crazy. It's like, oh no, Padre Pio brings people here. We're going to start counting. So um, I'll let you know next year. But I think, uh, I would say safely, we probably have about three, depending, we have our busy seasons and things. So Padre Pio's busy season really starts with like Lent because uh, he was so, I mean, he was the living passion, you know. So people really, so through Lent, very heavy through the summer, through our feast day. Um, now that we have permission to have masses and confessions on site, I suspect we're going to continue to have pilgrimage groups year-round, though it'll probably let up in the winter a little bit. We don't have winters like you have up here, but, but, we, but 
you know, we're not as we're not quite as tough as as y'all. We don't just keep rolling, rolling, rolling. But um, no, so so I suspect we're still going to have it through. I would say, on average, in a given week, we might have four to five pilgrimage groups that come with anywhere from one bus of 55 to to three buses of 150 or whatever. And then just walk-ins on a given day. If we don't have a group, I'd say we probably have anywhere from 30 to 60 people that might come through. We're open, you know, seven days a week. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe, maybe over 10,000. Anyway, our big feast day weekend, like 4,500, I'd say 10, 12,000, something like that. Yeah, it's really, it's really been on an uptick since we've had the, the, the privilege of having the sacraments there. So we'll, we'll wait and see. We've been consistently increasing staff, you know, here and there over the, over the past year to try to, you know, accommodate. So anybody else? All right, well, we're here, uh, Vera and another woman who's been working at the center. She actually just retired, poor Leonita Dowdy. She, in 1981, she started working for the center. She just retired like three weeks ago, and since then, she's been up for the novena all that time from Atlanta, Georgia. And then I said, can we tap you again to come to Wisconsin? So, she, <laughs> so she's back. So she's been here more since she retired than she's been in her new home with her son down in Atlanta. But uh, Leonita and Vera will be over there in the gift shop. I'm gonna be back over. Leonita's right now over with the relics. For anybody who didn't see, we have a, we have a glove relic that was her mother's uh, personal one. She wanted to bring up here special that, that used to go out on the road. So we have one of those that has the blood, uh, the scabs inside, so it is a first class relic. And then we have a little one in a reliquary of uh, a side, Padre Pio had a side wound. He had all five marks of, of Christ, hands, hands, feet, side, and then also he had a shoulder wound, which is a little uh, mysterious. But so that's a piece of the cloth from the uh, from the side wound that's in the little reliquary. Yeah, yeah. That that shoulder wound it wasn't really discovered until um, one of his brother friars that was asked to gather his personal belongings after he died had picked up uh, his shirt and saw that there was a mark on the shoulder. And the only person that he revealed that to actually when uh, Father Carol Watia in 1947, before he was Pope John Paul II, he went and he, he went to visit Padre Pio at San Giovanni, had his confession heard, and the Pope revealed later on that he had told him during that confession that he had that additional wound. We think it's because Padre Pio knew that he, you know, he would someday ascend to, uh, to be the Pope. And you might hear, there's a, there's a rumor, and it's like, we're 75% sure, but we don't want to say for sure. We try to just really give authentic information. Did Padre Pio predict that he would become the Pope? Well, there was a cardinal, forgive me, I don't remember his name, who said that Pope John Paul II told him that at that time in 47, he also, Padre Pio also told him, someday you will ascend to the highest office. And the Pope, uh, uh, Cardinal w Carol Wattia, assumed that, that when he became a cardinal, that that had been fulfilled, not realizing that he would become pope. But again, we can't fully authenticate that, but you might hear that sometimes, that he predicted that, you know, told him he was going to be pope someday. But yes? Which side and which shoulder was the wound on? Merciful heavens. The side, which side was it? Was it under the... Well, he has the, the wound from where the centurion stabbed. Right, I thought it was the left, yeah. his left side. And then the cross, was that on the right, on the right. I shoulder? I think so. Okay. Don't you think that wound on the shoulder is like the wound Christ would have had from carrying the cross? That's exactly, yes. So actually, the, I, I just heard something. Uh, the, the, the brother priest, was he a, I don't know if he was a, a brother or a priest, but the one who, who found that on the T-shirt and everything, he actually prayed to Padre Pio and said, would you let me know if you really, you know, had this thing? Because uh, there, there was another priest who had cared for Padre Pio that said, yes, I had noticed this sometimes too. He never talked about it with me. Uh, and then he actually woke up around one in the morning one night. He had, he had prayed for him to let him know. And he said he had a feeling in his shoulder as if someone had taken a knife and just cut off a piece of his flesh there. And after about five minutes, he was in absolute agony. He said, God, I, I can't take this anymore. And then he heard Padre Pio in his head. And it, he said at the same time that he was in so much pain and wished that he was dead rather than feel the pain, his soul had like this, this sweet longing for it not to go away, which Padre Pio kind of talked about with his suffering too. Um, and he said that Padre Pio, the pain stopped and he heard Padre Pio say to him, 
now you have a small understanding of what I experienced. But, yeah, there was a, uh, Father Modestino was his name. Yes? Um, there's a prayer booklet, the Piazza book. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. I think it's on page 29. Don't quote me because I forget. But there is a prayer to the holy uh, shoulder wound of Christ. Ah. And I guess there was a priest that had this interior um, revelation from Christ that he wanted people to honor his shoulder wound. Mm -hmm. And if he did, he would um, answer <coughs> Hmm. because he said that was the most painful wound and it was never mm -hmm. uh, actually revealed that he had it. It's mm -hmm. always, you know, the other wounds. Okay, so the, co the comment was that in the Pieta prayer book, a popular devotional book, that there's something in there about that Christ <laughs> was revealed to someone that Christ wanted them to have a devotion to his shoulder wound and that it was his most uh, painful wound, even though it wasn't. It's not something that's commonly known or talked about. And uh, there you go, page 22 of the Blue Pieta prayer book, which you may have in the gift shop, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so Padre Pio, uh, Padre Pio, the Pope said that that was, he told him that that was his most painful wound. Why he didn't talk more about it, I don't know. Okie does. Well, thank you so much for having us. Vera and Leonita will be over there. And, and we're going to have the relics here through... Uh, Friday afternoon. We're going to send the, the glove relic. We'll go home with, with, with Vera on Friday. I'm staying until Saturday, and I'll still have the side wound relic uh, with me over in the chapel. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.